Oh God, What Now, the politics podcast that would like to confirm it will definitely be standing at the next general election. I'm Alex Andreu. On today's show, Rishi Sunak is relaunching for what feels like the umpteenth time. We discuss how his plans are coming up against a formidable foe, reality. Plus, the Russian election saw plucky newcomer Vladimir Putin win a landslide victory. What does this mean for Russia and beyond? I ask expert Ben Noble. And in the extra bit for supporters, are you shaken or stirred by the new possible choice of actor to play James Bond? We discuss the future of the franchise. Let's meet the panel. Zoe Grunewald is a political correspondent for The Independent. Hi, Zoe. Hello. Zoe, Wales has a new First Minister, Vaughan Gething. Um, having been elected as the new leader of Labour in Wales last week, he was confirmed on Wednesday by the Senate. Um, what do we know about him? So uh, Vaughan Gething uh, is 50 years old. He turned 50 last Friday. Who doesn't look it. No, no, he looks very good. Mm. Um, so he describes himself as a Welshman born in Zambia. Um, his dad is a vet from South Wales and his mother was a Zambian chicken farmer. And they met while they were working in South Africa. Um, he was health minister during the COVID crisis and he had a bit of a scandal. He was <coughs> pictured eating chips in the park with his family during lockdown called Chip Gate. Um, <laughs> I think everyone had a gate of some sort during the pandemic, didn't they? Chip Gate is a good one to have. Yeah, I, feel. I, th I think so. <laughs> um, yes. And now he's going to be uh, uh, the new leader uh, of Wales, the new Labour leader of Wales. So obviously he's the first black leader of a European nation. Um, he joins um, a raft of other leaders who are now from black minority ethnic backgrounds, um, which is obviously a really significant thing for uh, the UK. I, I think know. it's the first time in history and it's, you know, fantastic to see where and, we've... And even, you know, two women sharing the Belfast mm -hmm. power. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah, it's extraordinary. So um, I think he's, he seems to be quite uh, popular in Labour circles. Um, I think he's one of those names that a lot of people didn't know until he got given this position. So it'll be interesting to see how he performs, mm. um, especially compared to Mark Draker, Drakeford, who was a bit of a kind of, you know, he was quite a well-known figure by the end of his, his term there as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. Uh, one thing that I did find quite uh, amusing is that he isn't a native Welsh speaker. So I wonder how that goes down with the people of Wales and maybe some of our listeners can tell us. But mm. yes, uh, very interesting character and obviously a great win for diversity. Fantastic. Um, Seth Tevo is a journalist, historian and author of Behind Closed Doors, The Secret Life of London's Members Clubs. Hello, Seth. Hello, hello. Seth, a question... Right in your wheelhouse today, the membership list of the Garrick Club has been made public for the first time. Yesterday, the recently recovered top civil servant, uh, Simon Case, japed in committee that he had only joined it to change it from within. Everyone laughed a lot. Uh, how big a deal is this? I think it's a fairly big deal, and not just because I think the Garrick is probably very concerned about the um, data breach that's happened. Um one of the standard things you get when there's something like a men-only club is that uh, we never talk shop. This has nothing to do with our day lives. And besides, we're utterly trivial people who don't really have any significance in, in the public sphere. Well, one of the problems is that um, as its reputation uh, has suggested already, there are a lot of senior lawyers. In fact, there are an awful lot of judges and the sort of career advice that's been doled around to many young aspiring barristers for some time has been if you want to get ahead in the law, uh, start socialising with judges, join the Garrett Club, which is rather difficult if you're a woman. Um, and mm. it's not just restricted to the law either. I mean, when you have senior figures within the Royal Opera House, the BBC, the English National Opera, the English National Ballet, you can see the significance it has in the arts. And these are all sectors where actually very serious questions are being asked about accessibility, diversity. Um, no one's suggesting that there's some massive conspiracy or that there's some papal conclave that happens at the Garrett Club. That's, that's simply not how it happens. However, our worldview is formed by our informal conversations all yeah, the time. Yeah. And if this place, which is just round the corner from the Royal Opera House, is where these natural sort of conversations happen, um, I think that's very much of public interest. Um, I think the thing I found most enlightening was that uh, hardy culture warrior and man of the people, our Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden, it turns out, is also a member of the Garrett Club. Mm. Now, before we begin, over the past couple of weeks, we've called on your help via Patreon, and the response has been incredible. 
If you want episodes ad-free and early, extra content, and most importantly, to simply help us navigate whatever British politics has in store, search Oh God What Now Patreon podcast to find out how, or there's a link in the show notes. We've also had loads of you existing supporters move up a tier, which means the world to us. If any of our old-school £2 tier backers would like to do the same, it could not be easier. Just go to our Patreon page, choose Membership, then upgrade and you're away. Thanks to all of you for your support. Now, in order to relaunch, you have to have launched. Sunak has tried to get off the ground more times than SpaceX. It seems to be an almost weekly event, each time wearing a fresh, focus grouped personality to try and fill in the void, which seems to be his actual personality. We've seen GQ Sunak, Geek Sunak, Jet Setter Sunak, Family Man <laughs> Sunak, One Nation Sunak, Hardline Sunak, Change Sunak, Continuity Sunak. We've even seen Change and Continuity Sunak. <laughs> But now we just seem to be entering an era of sad, deluded Sunak. He keeps muttering, we turned a corner, the plan is working and a brighter future, like a man in absolute impenetrable denial. It's like he's already been dumped, but he keeps coming round your house at night, leaving boxes of Quality Street and Beanie Babies and playing Peter Gabriel on his boombox. But his persistence really a substitute for strategy. Zoe... Sunak has suggested that Britain is going to bounce back this year. There is some support for that in Wednesday's inflation figures, but is the rate of decay slowing the same as people feeling things have got better? Well, first of all, I want to say what a great intro, because I was thinking, I guess he has done a lot of rebranding, but when you put it like that... The amount of rebranding we have gone through <laughs> I, is I extraordinary. I left yeah. out, <laughs> let I me mean, tell you. AI Sunak... Tech bro Sunak seemed a really big thing. And when you think, you know, the most recent budget we've had, the departure that that was from the Silicon Valley yeah. R&D Sunak, I mean, it's extraordinary. And that's in a really short space of time. Um, but to get to your question, uh, no, people aren't going to suddenly start feeling better. I mean, the cost of living is still it's still rising. Mm. It might be rising at a slower rate, but it's still rising. Um there's going to be a raft of people who are needing to remortgage soon and are going to be faced with much higher interest rates. Those interest rates aren't going to just go down. Um, and then, of course, you get a raft of renters as well who have been facing their landlords putting up prices to compete with the market. Landlords aren't going to suddenly put the prices of their mm. properties down. Why would you do that? Once the market rate's there, it's going to stay. Same with uh, supermarket prices, same with the cost of goods. I mean, all these these people, all these manufacturers, they aren't just going to suddenly start lowering their prices. Um, all these things drip through. They take a while anyway. But as we said, you know, the cost of living is still rising and people are still feeling that. And then on the other side of it, you have public services. That's something else that people feel when they talk about how well off they feel, when they talk about how well things are going. If people are being forced to yank out their own teeth with a pair of pliers or even stuff like printing their own train tickets, having to provide pens for their schools. I mean, those are all things that go into that pot of actually I'm not feeling better off. I'm not mm, feeling mm. like this economy is Council working. Council tax will go up. Council tax. Exactly. All these things. So Sunak might be, I think, breathing a sigh of relief at today's inflation figures. But I think he knows and the Tory party knows that that isn't going to magically change things on the doorstep. People are still going to say, yes, but I'm not feeling better off than I was five years ago, 14 years ago. Um, as we record on Wednesday, um, he faced PMQs. Um, it felt weirdly pre-election-y, mm. I, I think. It, it, I mean, Starmer rattled off a list of failures that feels as if it will be the thing we hear again and again. And Sunak tried to sort of battle it off with, you know, you don't have a plan. Mm. Our plan is working. Please, please. I know we've had 14 years, but we need another couple of months. Um, how do you think it's going for him? I, I think that's totally correct. I mean, it really did feel like the start of the local elections campaign. Mm. Um, Starmer, I mean, this particular PMQs <coughs> felt a little bit I think, all over the place. And that's because Starmer wanted to hit every single, yeah, yeah. this isn't working, this isn't working. So uh, violent prisoners are being released earlier. Small boat arrivals are still really high. The NHS is crumbling. Mortgages, pensioners, unfunded tax cuts. Um, and you're right, Sunak's only response really was, well, what's your plan? Labour don't have a plan. Now, Labour 
are going to keep their cards close to their chest. A, they're not in government. B, anything good that they, they put out <laughs> into the ether gets nicked. gets nicked anyway. And C, people, I mean, the, I think Labour are right to tap into this, that people are saying, actually, you've been in government for 14 years. So if things aren't better than when you started, why would we vote for you again? People are out of patience. Mm. You know, they say we have 14 years, as you said, or another couple of months going to work. So, yeah, I mean, you always have to caveat it with how many people actually watch PMQs, how many people pick up that back and forth. Um, but I think you're right in that this is the start of an attack line we're going to hear a lot more, which mm. is that just nothing works. I, c I don't think I can remember a party leader who has tried to relaunch more often. <laughs> Is it actually drawing attention to the fact that, as Tim Montgomery put it, uh, the founder of Conservative Home, he's a decent man that just can't do politics? I think his inexperience is something to be said for it. I also think he surrounds himself with quite a young team of advisors mm. um, and quite a confused team of advisors. I think Sunak is always torn between the right of his party and caving to them and this sort of, well, actually, our party always has one when it's a bit one nation-y and it's a bit in the middle. And, you know, he brought David Cameron back in as a yeah, kind yeah. of show of that as well. So I think what you actually have is somebody who's quite inexperienced as a politician, whose skills lie a lot more with the, you know, he's a much better chancellor, I think, than he was a prime minister in many ways. Well, it was very easy to be chancellor at the time, I'd point out. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> giving loads of money. Exactly. But I think that that sort of popularity and that charm he had that people, you know, and I say all this mm, in inverted mm. commas before any of the listeners get particularly angry with me. Um, I think that was because he was much better at the sort of day-to-day -day management stuff, you know, the Goldman yeah, Sachs yeah. stuff. Actually, he doesn't have any vision. He's quite confused as a leader. He doesn't have any strategy. And and he's surrounded by lots of competing interests because the Conservative Party is falling apart. So I do think he throws an idea out there. It doesn't stick. People don't like it. And he's forced to rebrand. But you're right. I mean, really, what we need is a leader with a very coherent vision and someone who is strong. And I think when people talk about Sunak being weak, they are picking on something, which is that he is just all over the place and doesn't really have the courage of any of his convictions. With it, yes, because some of the things on which he has hung the relaunches are just pathetic. So strange, I mean, yeah. You know, do, do, we're banning disposable vapes. Let's do a relaunch. I mean, this is stuff that junior ministers would go to a photo opportunity for. And it just feels like he's never allowed himself to gather enough kinetic energy and enough of a platform to do an actual relaunch because he expends it all on weekly relaunches, mm. on really minor things. And does his strategy at the moment feel like mitigation or could it develop into a winning strategy? I mean, I don't mean will he win the election. I mean, is he trying even to win the election? I think the Conservatives possibly have in their back pocket something that looks a bit like an attack dossier and they're just <clears throat> hoping that if they attack Labour enough mm. some of it might stick. I don't think there's going to be any big sudden final rebrand mm. of Sunak as so everyone goes oh that's mm. who he is and that's mm. what he's offering. I think they're just thinking they can hammer away they can take chunks out of Labour. We've seen it a bit with how they've been treating Angela Rayner over the past couple of weeks you know mm. going for her on the housing stuff um, but I don't think there's any sensible long-term strategy here. I think mm. it's taking chunks out of Labour and randomly throwing things out and seeing if they can stick. Yeah, I, I, I think former leader of the Tory party is quite a relaunch. <laughs> um, now, Seth, what do you think are the main obstacles to these relaunches working? Why do they keep fizzling out. I think the elephant in a room is that so many of these are, are policy-based and actually their problem is trust. Mm. You know, there's an old saying in marketing... Trust or trust? Trust. Okay. trust. <laughs> trust. Bit, bit they are related. <laughs> the concepts are related. There, there's an old saying in marketing that trust comes on foot and leaves on horseback. Trust or trust? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> you can see this but is it's, a it's, it's a really important point, which is that actually... Up until the turning point this parliament, and if you look at most of the polling, the Conservative vote was actually holding up very strongly mm. 
Um, they could almost do no wrong up until very late in 2021. And it really does look like it was Partygate that was a turning point, because up until then, we were already facing a cost of living crisis. It was always plainly, it was plainly apparent already that uh, things like sourcing of PPE was a major crisis, that the government handling of the pandemic was a crisis. That didn't necessarily harm their vote particularly. Since then, people have noticed in a big way. Mm. And yes, when trust <laughs> tanks the economy, <laughs> people notice. Um, but it, it really comes down to that feeling of having a loss of trust. Um, there's a cognitive dissonance which was there beforehand, which is no longer there. People used to say, well, I, I'm having a terrible experience day to day, but I don't blame the government for it. Now, people are joining the dots and saying mm. the government is very much to blame for this. And at the same time, I would point out that Starmer, I think, that's exactly the period no. within which he took a lot of action to de detoxify the Labour brand as an alternative. Right. And th those things seem to have worked hand in hand. Do you think bringing people like Cameron back into the fold that Zoe pointed out, does that make it harder to relaunch, to say we're you know, under new management? There's even rumours of Johnson helping out with the campaign. I mean, surely the optics of that are horrible. I think it's a brilliant masterstroke at what it's designed to do, which is the argument that the secret weapon of the Conservative Party has always been loyalty and unity and that it brings them all together. Uh -huh. And it actually helps um, It helps Richard Sunak survive another week or two um, and brings this party together. The only problem is it has no effect whatsoever on the rest of the country. Um, and it, as you say, it almost resigns yeah, yeah. Uh, just trying to persuade anyone outside of the Conservative Party. Mm. Historically... Do relaunches, political relaunches, I mean, of leaders, do they work or do they fail? And what are they? Are there sort of common threads, conditions that determine whether they succeed or fail? Weirdly, I think Tory prime ministers have generally been a lot better at them than Labour prime ministers. I the only one I can think of on the Labour side who was very good at comebacks was Harold Wilson. Apart from that, you know, John Major managed this extraordinary turnaround. Uh, everyone said, call an election ASAP in 91. He waited, but actually turned that to his advantage. Even David Cameron, I mean, he was lagging around behind in the polls in 2013, but he mm. stuck it out and actually did turn it around in the last year or two of the parliament. Um, you know, Thatcher, I mean, there were riots in the streets on Thatcher in the early 80s and the mid 80s and she still won landslides in 83 and 87 we can go into the reasons for that but she was able to at least garner something of a vote you mm. know the magic 40 percent that you needed um even people like Harold Macmillan was no, no one predicted Macmillan coming after the Suez crisis in 1957 was going to win a majority a third successive increased majority for the Tories mm. in that election um Tory prime ministers have usually been quite good which highlights just how bad, how bad. this present generation is <laughs> um any more relaunches you can think of? Biden seems yeah. to have started a bit of a fight back with his State of the Union address. I think it's quite fashionable to sort of diss Biden and, and sort of say, oh, he's a doddery old man and so on. Actually, Biden is a very effective politician and a very experienced politician. He understands the way the US system works is in two-year cycles. He spends the first year of that hunkering down and seeing to legislation, which is why he basically disappeared from view mm. in 2021 and 2023. That's what good legislators do. And after the sort of fiasco of Afghanistan, and let's not beat around the bush, it was a fiasco, uh, people were saying, oh, well, there's no recovering for Joe Biden. He won't do this. But 2022 was just bam, 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 policy announcement, rollout, legislation, mm. achievement, Mm. wall to wall and I think what's that's and what suddenly we, he had a much better midterm and than that's anyone what, had a phenomenally good midterm yeah. of, of, of the type no US president has had since 1936 so I think what we're going to see is actually a very energised uh, democratic campaign around Biden for precisely that reason mm. um, so the mordant situation let's call it mm. that what's your reading of it is there is there genuine momentum coming from like her camp or other briefings coming from the her leadership ad adversaries using her as a sort of unwilling stalking horse because there's a little bit of that going around too. Yeah, I think Tory leadership contests can get very underhand. Game right? of Thrones. Yes, yeah. Game of Thrones. -y. <laughs> and people do brief and counter brief and people do chuck out names to take the attention off themselves. I do think that's true and Morden's camp has suggested this is part of what's going on. But I do think she wants to be Tory leader. And I think everybody knows she really wants to be Tory leader. I mean, she came quite close last time. Um, and 
You know, there's a few things recently that she's been doing as Commons leader. So, for example, she has watered down this very sticky proposal that has been sort of in the ether in the House of Commons for some time about um, making sure that if an MP is accused of a violent or sexual crime, they are um, made to stay away from the estate. Mm. Currently, it's a sort of gentleman's agreement and lots of MPs don't adhere to it. So Imran Khan, when he was um, under investigation for sexual assault, he attended the estate. Uh, Crispin Blunt, who is under a police investigation, has also been on the estate recently. So uh, MPs and staff and unions have called for them to tighten these rules. And uh, the proposal that came out, the motion that was going to be voted on was that you would see uh, MPs being made to stay away from um, the estate at the point of arrest. Now, she has watered down this proposal, so it will be charged instead. And that is because there are lots of Tory backbenchers who don't like it, who think it is in some way incompatible with their right as an MP to attend the estate Mm. and represent their constituents. And it seems like one of those sort of small commons, you know, procedural arguments, but actually it is quite significant when you think about why she might cave to pressure from conservative backbenchers, what that is sort of saying about her role as Commons leader. Um, Yes, because, yes. mm. Because, I mean, if she didn't care about the numbers in her column, as it were, she wouldn't be trying to balance those. Precisely. Yeah. And then there's other stuff as well. I mean, we saw we all saw her speech, which was slightly strange, at a Conservative Party conference last year. You know, the get up and fight one. When you get up slightly and fight, strange. I get up and fight and he gets up. And, yeah. Slightly very, strange. Very, very weird. But it was giving, I don't think it was very successful, but it was giving, I am a leader in the most obvious way Mm. um so absolutely i do think she wants it whether these reports were kind of released by opposition camps to neutralize that bid it's a different question um but it is interesting that she hasn't come out publicly and said that she's standing by sunak she's sent her sources and her advisors out but she's not said anything and Um, she does know the effect of that because when she stands by sunak you stand stand by by sunak Sunak. exactly he stands by sunak (laughs) (laughs) now um, do you think someone would have to resign after the election if they took over now? I'm, I've been trying to game this in mm. football terms, mm. apologies, but are, are the expectations of those of a sort of football manager taking over when your team is already 20 points behind and fully expecting relegation because they're the person that will then work on the long-term project of getting you back in the premiership or whatever? See, this is why I don't think there will be a leadership contest before the election, and which is why, I, and also why I think a lot actually don't want one. Mm. Because who would want that poison chalice of leading the party into electoral oblivion? I just think all of them are vying to be le- leaders, but they all want to be leader after the election. Mm. Um, so this is, I, I think. But I, could they depose a leader that took over at this point with, let's face it, very low expectations, mm. right? They expect to be obliterated. <laughs> if she, you know, if she could man- manufacture some kind of general election where they end up with 150 seats, it would be considered a tremendously mm. good result, mm. right? Yes, if you could sort of turn it around slightly. I mean, there was a bit of a rumour going around not that long ago that David Cameron would be you know, installed again as caretaker, you know, as a caretaker leader of the Conservative Party. But... Um, I yeah, he took such good care of it this yeah, first time. Yeah. And you know, he really cares about the party and the country, clearly. Um no, I think it would be mad to do so. And I think a lot of the people who want to see a leadership contest aren't the people who want to be leader, mm. which I think tells you something about yeah. what the party would do with the leader after yeah. the election. As I've been saying all along, I see the logic in what you say, I see the sense of it. But it credits the totality of the Tory party with a sort of joint will that just isn't there. What you have is 300 odd people each looking at the polling in their own constituency and thinking, might I just shave um, into back into parliament with Penny Mordaunt as a leader? Because at the moment it's looking like I'm definitely out. Um, Seth, Jacob Rees-Mogg says the decline in Tory popularity isn't Sunak's fault, and we know he loves Johnson, and he supported Truss. Mm. So whose fault is it? (laughs) I mean, technically speaking, he's not entirely wrong, because during Sunak's time in power, uh, 
Tory poll ratings have gone down by an average of 3 to 5%. That's not the cataclysmic thing that's gone beforehand. So the, to answer your question, I mean, the collapse was under Johnson and then under Truss. Mm. Mm. You know, but then one might ask Jacob Rees-Mogg, who of the Johnson's major cheerleaders was fronting his government for a large part of it as a media spokesperson? Mm. Yes, I, I always like to point out to those that say, you know, Johnson at the time he was chucked out was only... <laughs> eight points behind or whatever. But the point is, he started 22 points ahead. So that's not a small collapse no. in your vote. Um, when the public has made up its mind, is it basically impossible to turn them around? Uh, you know, once they've decided they just mm. want you out, is there anything that will convince them to give you more time? And does it actually risk further vexing mm. voters to hold on long after your welcome has run out. Might things get mm. worse for them? Yeah, th there is actually a lot on this, and it does come back to this issue of trust. Mm. And a lot of it comes back to uh, the literature, actually, weirdly enough, is not very political. It's mainly in the area of business studies. There's a huge uh -huh. amount of psychological research and, and things around how people react. And there is a sort of standard playbook. If, if you have a reputational problem, you've lost trust from some massive misjudgment that you've made. And the three steps you basically take are you sack everyone who's associated with that policy. Uh -huh. You issue a complete and unreserved apology, promising you will never, ever do anything like that ever again. And you form a, a you perform a dramatic U-turn uh, on policy. Now, unfortunately, such are the sort of norms of British public policy, and dare I say it, the machismo of our party political yeah, yeah. structure. That ain't going to happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, a and also I I don't know whether practically there's enough people to go around <laughs> that are not tainted by some previous administration that's like really recent. Mm. I'm not talking about ten years ago here. No. Most of the people who have the skill to be minister and many who mm. don't have been it. Yeah. And so you end up essentially having the reins of government being inherited by the kinds of people who speak at the PopCon. What a thought to end this topic on. <laughs> Now, let's have a question from one of our Patreon backers in But Your Emails. If you support us on Patreon, you too can submit a question for the panel. Make it a good one. Thomas Gaston writes, In my quiet moments, I like to play with the electoral calculus website, oh, Thomas, <laughs> to create a scenario where the Lib Dems become the second largest party, oh, Thomas. <laughs> It is hard to achieve because reducing the vote share for the Tories seems to benefit Labour much more than Lib Dems or anyone else in terms of seats. While on paper the Lib Dems are second place in a lot of seats, they don't seem to be positioning themselves as rivals to the Tories in a lot of these seats. Why? That's actually a really good question. Mm. I mean, it's worth looking at how the Lib they Dems... They are kind of the <laughs> invisible party at the moment, yeah. aren't they? But if, if you look at how the Lib Dems have won seats from the Tories historically, and they yeah. used to be the sort of second party in the south of England, and so it would do quite well with this, usually, counterintuitively, they win Tory seats with Labour votes. If you look at your archetypal seats mm. in the south where they're second place, Conservatives on 40%, Lib Dems on 30%, Labour on 20%. They squeeze that 20% of Labour voters mm, as tactical mm. voters to go over the threshold and get sort of 45% and outnumber the Tories. So as a result, and I mean, this is why something like the coalition was so toxic to the Lib Dems. It's not because it harmed their credential with, uh, credentials with these sort of um, wavering voters between the Lib Dems and the Tories. It's because all the people who've been tactically voting for them from the left said, hang on, I don't want to have anything more to do with that. Um, so there are some interesting positions with that. The other thing around the coalition's legacy is that you cannot underestimate how much the Lib Dem vote collapsed in 2015. I mean, if you look at an electoral map up to 2010 of the seats where the Lib Dems were first or second in the UK, you were on about a third of the electoral map. You're on a good 200 mm. constituencies mm. of the UK. It went down to about 50. And yes, it's gone up since then. And obviously, when we're looking at a map, we're looking at the country five years ago in 2019. Yeah. But a lot of the places where the Lib Dems are in second place, they only just got back into second place very narrowly in 2019, having lost their sort of basis in the intervening decade. Yeah. So it's, it's a really tough one. Um, so do you think if if that analysis is right, and it sounds instinctively um, right to me, 
we have seen evidence from all the by-elections that people are much more willing to vote tactically and much smarter about voting tactically. Might that mean that that slightly lower share of Lib Dem um, percentages in the polling might translate into a lot more seats than people anticipate? Um, yeah, I think potentially. I mean, I think it's it's interesting, and I'm actually sat here thinking about Thomas's question because it has occurred to me that the Lib Dems have been particularly quiet. Mm. And, you know, there is a suggestion that maybe they're just sort of bulking up their manifesto or maybe a Davies run scared from the post office stuff a little bit. Um, but it is interesting. You kind of ask, what are you planning? What are you up to? What are you to? doing, Ed? Yes. He did it's launch like his campaign today. It's like the kids have been very quiet suddenly <laughs> yeah. next door. And you, and you start to think... I don't like this. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting what you said about the vote collapsing in 2015. And I do also wonder to what extent the Liberal Democrats, some of their policies have become actually quite unpopular. I mean, planning reform and housing have become such a big part, I think, or will be such a big part of the next election. And obviously the Lib Dems have tended to run on a bit of a NIMBY platform. Mm. I do wonder how much that will impact the Lib Dems vote share as well. And of course, the Lib Dems also have been a bit of a protest vote in the past. When you have parties like reform popping up and you've got the Greens and other you know, potential parties that people might want to sort of nibble away at the Conservatives vote share with, mm. it does make you wonder what the not what the purpose of the Lib Dems are, but why someone would would now vote for them. Um, and, you know, unless you were in a constituency where it really was Lib Dem, Conservative, neck and neck, and you wanted the Tories out. Now, in a year full of elections, it was one of the most difficult to predict. But Vladimir Putin has scraped through with 87% of the vote in Russia's knife-edge election. This means he is set to stay in power until 2030 at least, having ruled since 2000 pretty much. The result was a foregone conclusion, of course, but what can we glean from it? And what is the state of Russian politics in general at the moment? I spoke to Ben Noble, Associate Professor of Russian Politics at University College London and co-author of the book Navalny, Putin's Nemesis, Russia's Future. Hi, Ben. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Ben, talk me through just the top line numbers from the election, like anything sticks out. Yeah, the official result is that Putin got 87% of the vote on a 77% turnout. But I should stress that is the official result. Uh, this is, of course, a landscape in Russia where elections are not free. They're not fair. And according to some preliminary analysis that's been done, not by me, but by colleagues in Russia, around maybe 20 million of those votes have been falsified. Of course, that's going to require more detailed analysis to work out what's gone wrong. But we know that the authorities mm. make sure that there is no rival to Putin, that the electoral playing field is so unleveled that Putin was guaranteed victory. So does that mean that 20 million people were invented in the vote? Or does it mean that they voted for someone else and the vote has gone to Putin anyway? So these are very preliminary results. Mixture. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very preliminary results. And it may be worthwhile having a separate podcast episode with the people mm. who carried that out. But I suppose I'm using that as a way as a headline figure to point out the various forms of manipulation that take place. Mm. It's not just ballot stuffing. It's not just um, many ballot papers being stuffed into the voting urns that we now have video proof of. You have video proof of that for every Russian election, but they've already come out for this presidential election, ballot stuffing takes place, but also there are forms of manipulation that happen well before the vote, including the fact that on Russian state TV, there's just wall-to-wall -wall sycophantic coverage of Putin, mm. that Putin gets rid of rivals uh, by blocking candidacies, by locking them up, by forcing them into exile, all, all with Alexei Navalny, by killing them or yeah. assassinating them. So there are many ways in which the vote is manipulated, rigged, such that Putin is presented as the leader without alternative. And I think that's a really important point to make when we're thinking about the level of support for Putin, that yes, there are those who really ardently support him. Mm. There are those who think that he is the future of Russia, but there are also those still in Russia who detest him. I would say the most important group is the large middle. 
And they're people with ambivalent feelings regarding Putin. And we have to work out why they would go to vote. And if they vote, why they would vote for Putin. Part of the reason why they would vote for Putin is because he's presented as that leader without alternative. And they say, OK, well, if I'm going to vote, then might as well vote for yeah. Putin. But we should also remember the forms of other forms of manipulation, like for the ambivalent middle especially if they work, if they're employed by the state, they will face pressure and they have faced pressure. And there is evidence that this time they face pressure to vote and to vote for Putin. Mm. For example, they would be pressured by their bosses to go and vote and sometimes to take a picture of their ballot paper showing uh, who they voted Thank for. Um, we have also seen footage of soldiers with guns sort of drawing back the curtain and checking over people's shoulder. Um, it, and I guess... It is a country where the, you know, the memory of the KGB days is at most one generation away. So is there a sort of paranoia that if they vote somehow differently, the state would know, the authorities would know, or they might find out? Yeah, those videos are really quite shocking. We're, and, and of course, they're shocking because they violate a basic principle of electoral democracy. Of course, Russia is not an electoral democracy, but according to its constitution, mm, it is. Mm. And the secrecy of the ballot is supposed to be guaranteed. It's not. And those videos are the starkest demonstration of what appears to be members of law enforcement seeing people behind the curtain when they're voting, um, spoiling a ballot. And that seems to be the reason why law enforcement are going in. Wow. So it's not necessarily voting for uh, one of the three other candidates who have been vetted by the Kremlin to stand as foil so that Putin can say that, oh, look, these are contested elections. Mm. Um, it could be people going in, spoiling their ballot, including we know many cases of people writing Alexei Navalny's name down because that's the candidate that they wanted yeah, yeah. on the ballot. But of course, now he's dead. Um, we have also seen some evidence of, of protest and passive resistance. But it strikes me that in the circumstances, you know, considering how recently Navalny was uh, murdered and the war in Ukraine, they don't seem to be as prominent as protests in Russia have been before. For instance, on the, on the subject of uh, uh, um, retirement, where a lot more people took to the street mm. actually to protest about their pension. Mm. So... What's what's going on here? It, I mean, my my instinct says that you know this country has had no real political choice for such a long time mm. that politics has almost dropped from public consciousness as a thing about which you talk, you protest. As it, it is basically an unchangeable. So why bother? Yeah, I think my I've got many things to say in yeah. regard to that. The first point to make is that the Russia of 2024 is not the Russia of 2018. I think you're referring so to even. Oh, yeah. 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 So even in the last six years. Oh, yes, it, definitely. Mm. So if you're referring to the process, which I think you are, and they relate to the pension reforms that yeah, were introduced yeah. soon after, well, relatively soon after the last presidential election in 2018, then yes, people, uh, Putin's approval rating, uh, for uh, it fell. And we saw protest votes in the September elections that took place in the same year. There was still space then for people to protest. Less space than there was even a, a couple of years before. We have seen um, a, a marked change in the space available for people to protest, though, especially since Navalny returned to the country in January 2021. That's, I think, when the Kremlin said, enough's enough. We are now just going to stamp out those um, autonomous political opposition organizations, mm. individuals, groups within the country. So uh, the general space for dissenting voices has markedly reduced. And uh, it, I would say whenever we see forms of protest, including those that we saw during the three days of voting, like people setting alight um, at polling stations, mm. pouring in into uh, voting urns, that's remarkable because it shows extraordinary bravery. These yeah, people who yeah. know they're probably going to end up behind bars for many, many years. Mm. We saw, though, uh, what was a really interesting initiative, the opposition thinking, we have elections, what do we do? Do we boycott? Because if we take part, then yeah. we might somehow indicate that they're legitimate. 
or do we take part in a way that allows us to show our dissent? And there was an initiative called Noon Against Putin, where members of the opposition agreed at midday on Sunday, the final day of voting, uh, those who wanted to show their dissatisfaction with the authorities would turn up and they'd be able to see each other. And it would di be difficult for the authorities to clamp down on them because they're voting. And of course, the state allows voting because yeah. it was carrying out a state election. And even then, we saw, according to reporting from the, within Russia, people being detained for turning mm. up at midday voting. They would say, well, I'm just, you know, exercising my constitutional right to vote. But because they turn up at 12, the authorities stepped in. And looking forward, it's it's incredibly difficult to work out what the opposition still remaining in the country is going to do. I, I wanted to ask you about that. Has someone emerged to sort of fill that void left by Navalny? Are there maybe people competing for that position? I think there's a real danger in waiting for a Navalny 2.0 to turn up. Mm. Navalny was an extraordinary individual, and there were many reasons why somebody like him emerged over time and why only really one person like him emerged. Yes, there are other figures that we could point to, but nobody quite with his profile. Mm. And that's the reason why he's Karamurza, now dead. Karamurza, I think, is the, the sort of closest Ilya Yashin, proxy. exactly. The, yeah. the, there are, of course, there are political prisoners, and we should make sure that we mention their name to keep mm. them uh, in, in discussion, the fact that we don't forget them. It's part of the danger of just focusing too much on Navalny that we might forget that yeah, there yeah, are, yeah. of course, other political prisoners. So thanks for mentioning those names. Some people would point to Yulia Navalny. Alexei Navalny's wife, mm. stepping up in a way that she hasn't previously to carry on his mission. And that shows extraordinary bravery. Yeah. She voted in Berlin and took part in the Noon Against um, uh, Putin uh, initiative. Yulia Navalny has stepped up and that shows extraordinary bravery. Uh, but she's not Navalny. There's a reason why mm. she resisted stepping forward into public politics while he was alive. Uh, but also, it you know, time will tell how she performs. It could be that she can become this rallying figure for the opposition. But I should also say, when we're talking about the political opposition in Russia, it's heavily factionalized. There are competing characters, yeah. competing in individuals, lots of big egos. And of course, that suits the Kremlin, because if the opposition is bickering um, uh, within itself amongst the individuals, then it, it allows the Kremlin to carry on with what it's doing. It could be that going forward, because of the extraordinary situation within the country, that there is a moment where they do come together and realize that their priority is, well, what Navalny called for, Russia without Putin. Yeah. Um, but as I say, only time will tell. Um Ben, why does Putin persist with a sort of the pretense of democracy? What does that do for you? Does this so-called victory, even though everyone understands it to be a pretense, does it open options for him that are not open without it? I think there are various reasons why Putin continues with rigged elections. And one of them is to demonstrate to the elite that he's still in control, that he can still pull off a thumping electoral victory. Yes, resorting to manipulation, mm. but he's able to do it. And yeah. he's able to report 87% uh, approval according to the official results. And I would say that doesn't bear uh, resemblance to what the actual results would be. But as I said before, we need to carry out analysis to work out yeah, yeah. quite how wide that margin is. And I mean, is. the strange thing is that... Is that because each time he needs to show a higher percentage, he's kind of running out of road. Oh, definitely. And I think that's a really important point to make, that, yes, when talking about Russia, we often make it just about Russia. But if we look at Russia as a type of personalist autocracy, we know that there are similar dynamics at play, mm. that there is pressure at each election for the result to be higher, mm. to make it seem to the elite and to the population and to the international community, even if they know that this is all a farce, that the leader is even more popular, yeah. that even more people are on board with his vision. But also, as well as central direction saying the figure needs to be higher than the previous election, which it was, there are also lower level pressures that mean that the results go up. And that is lower level officials wanting to impress their superiors yeah, yeah, yeah. by saying, look, 
our particular Look at voting what station. I've exactly, yeah, we've yeah. been able to outcompete the next door neighbor yeah, yeah. Um, at voting district, and so there are various different ways in which we will see those figures rise over time. So the next presidential election will be in 2030, and the reason why that's possible is because Putin changed the constitution in 2020 uh, to allow him to have two more six-year terms. When it comes to that, would not be surprised if we see 90 or above percent approval for precisely those reasons. And, you know, then we're in um, really interesting territory. Russia, uh, the results are so ridiculous, but it makes sense, given that Russia is a personalist autocracy mm. that Putin has now ruled over for nearly a quarter of a century. But is there also a sense that he's sort of, I don't know, gaslighting the West a little bit? He, he seems to me as a personality to derive some sort of perverse delight by sitting there and saying things that he knows are a lie and everyone knows are a lie, but he's still able to look down the barrel of the camera and tell it and kind of challenge you as the Western viewer. Yeah, he definitely enjoys that. He enjoys, uh, for example making clear that he has planned something all along, something at the time mm. that he said, oh, no, there's been no planning. So, for example, when he when it was announced that he would be running again in the 2012 presidential election after being prime minister for four years, for a long time, they had said uh, he had said with Dmitry Medvedev, who held the presidency for those four years, ke uh, kept Putin's seat warm. Uh, that nothing was being decided, they hadn't decided it. But after the fact, as a demonstration of Putin's power, he said, no, I knew all along. I was planning to come back. Mm. And so, yes, there is a pattern of him showing at uh, points that he's in control. But I should say it's not just for a Western audience. And I would say the Western audience probably isn't the primary or secondary audience. Lots of this is directed internally. Mm. I've already mentioned the elite, and we shouldn't forget yeah, yeah. that lots of this is performing to the elite to, to show that he's still in control, as well as to the population as a whole, but also to demoralize the opposition, to say, you can do whatever you want. You can come up with your initiatives that allow you to take part in an election. Action, but at the end of the day, I'm still here. I'm going to be here, and I'm going to destroy any way um, that you, any steps that you take in order to take uh, me on at my own game. Mm. Okay, final question: um, Will it basically take Putin dying for any kind of democratic push to be revived? Will it even at that point? Mm. So, if Putin runs again in 2030. He will be president until 2036. By that stage, he'll be 83. Given uh, the personist autocracy that he's created, it does seem likely that the only way that Putin stops being president is by dying. If he's still alive by 2036, maybe he changes the constitution again. Maybe mm. he writes a new constitution mm. that gets rid of all of the democratic language. And well, who knows? I mean, there's there's lots of conjecture there. But Maybe he makes himself czar. Who knows? Creates a new position. Who knows? Mm. I mean, we've ended up now in a situation that I wouldn't have predicted, even if, well, how many years ago? Five years ago, say. Things have got much worse, much quicker. And of course, we've got through all of this without mentioning Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Yeah. And that is so important when we're thinking about what Putin is going to do in his next presidential term. I think he's going to be emboldened by the result, even though he's created it, or at least, you know, added uh, many millions uh, of votes to suggest that he has overwhelming support in the country. He'll be emboldened. He'll be more aggressive. I think we're likely to see much more oppression at home, including against scapegoat groups like the LGBTQ plus community. What Putin has been doing over the last few years is creating a sort of nascent state ideology that uh, revolves around what the Kremlin calls traditional values. Yeah, yeah. And they want to paint members of the LGBTQ plus community as fifth columnists, as a Western yeah, yeah, implant, yeah. as sort of the West trying to degrade Russian society a from corruption the inside. Of exactly. True Russia. And so I just, in terms of predictions, I'm, I, I don't like predicting usually because, of course, political scientists have a really bad track record of predictions, especially when it comes to Russia. But unfortunately, uh, repression, I think, across the board will increase, but also specifically regarding particular groups, and that will make the situation even uglier. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Seth, you heard Ben say to me there that the rush of 2024 is not even the rush of 2018. How much further is there to go in terms of the grip 
tightening before the world starts to treat Putin explicitly as a sort of dangerous ethno dictator? I'm not sure that we, as a nation or indeed as a, a wider culture, actually care that much, sadly, about the internal goings on within Russia. You know, if we did, we would have intervened a long time ago. Mm. But if there's one byproduct of the Iraq war, it's a certain marked reluctance to get involved in domestic affairs. Expansionism is another matter. And the re growing realisation that ethno-nationalism is absolutely at the heart of Putin's approach to his rule is something which I think we're only very slowly waking up to. Um, it's interesting how in the last couple of years Putin has completely abandoned any pretense uh, that this was really about trying to denazify Ukraine. He's now fallen back upon the idea that it's always been territorially part That's of Russia. True. And the problem is that anywhere in the world that has however briefly been a Russian possession for even only a few months, hundreds of years ago, is viewed by Putin as rightfully his. And anywhere that's not included within that, that is within Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, is it's essentially... Potentially. His. No, but I, I, I wouldn't go that far. But it is viewed as something which needs to be a buffer zone. It needs mm. to be uh, safe. It needs to be essentially owned by Russia, not actually with a puppet government installed, but with you know enough Russian interests that can come and go freely, unchallenged, so they own all the major assets and so forth, that you know London Grad, as the phenomenon was known a decade ago, was just to the tip of the iceberg. And so I think that, unfortunately, until we sort of realise that that's who we're dealing with, um, it may be too late. You know, he is very much playing the long game on this uh, because he doesn't have to worry about things like re-election and public opinion polls. And so some of his long-term gambits are proving successful. You know, the idea of divide and rule amongst the allies, the idea of fermenting dissent, the idea that defunding um, so much of NATO's efforts and commitments towards the defence of Ukraine mm. can pay dividends in five, ten years. In possible. that context, how worried should the EU end or to be by, by Putin's pact with Serbia? I'd be very worried. I mean, within 24 hours of this being announced, uh, Serbia was threatening to invade Kosovo. Now, do I think it's likely to happen? Not necessarily. But again, this is how Putin operates. It's by fermenting dissent. Mm. It's by thinking, ooh, we as NATO now have multiple priorities and we need yeah, to defund yeah. that in favour of our Yeah, fight things. this little fire over mm. here as well. Mm. Zoe, uh, when it comes to the UK's position on Russia, would would a change of government at the election change anything, do you think? Well, I think when uh, when politicians talk about Russia in the UK, they, they're talking about Putin very interchangeably. Yeah. And, you know, it's you, much more than any other nation do we use Putin's name in kind of... I mean, that's a reflection a, of the grip he has on Absolutely. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that uh, the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, put out quite a very strong statement um, following the uh, results of the Russia election. Um, and there have been lots of questions about how the UK government responds to a, a, a state that doesn't allow free mm. and fair elections. Of course, the death of uh, his major political opponent, Alex Navalny, as well, has, has caused media attention. But I think there's, I think there's a slight tension going on here which is a few things, a few sort of domestic political issues. One of them is over our defence spending, which has sort of exploded into political discourse a bit yeah. this week mm -hmm. and actually could be the basis of a Tory leadership contest. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more talk about this getting to 3% um, as our defence budget. now. And I think if you're listening, Labour... A very smart platform for your manifesto, mm. actually. Absolutely. And it's something people increasingly care about yeah. when we talk about, you know, it's not just people know that warfare no longer is something that just happens overseas that we send troops to. You know, it affects yeah, yeah. Our, our cyber capabilities, our energy, etc. You know, people really felt the cost in their in energy prices. And then there's the other issue, which is just what is going to happen in America and how does the UK government respond if there is a... Trump presidency. And, you know, we saw that interaction between David Cameron and Marjorie Taylor Greene, where he wrote what he thought was a very statesmanlike letter to Congress. Yeah, you know, please kiss my ass. Yeah, please give Ukraine this, pass this uh, bill to give Ukraine all this money. And she, she said, yeah, kiss my ass. And I think that showed actually how fractious uh, 
international politics have become and how possibly the old sort of statesman-like way that the UK conducted themselves, it's just not really how America and Russia and all these big powers that are much bigger mm, than us mm. and do control the political agenda are now going to interact. And I think you just couldn't imagine David Cameron being like, oh, I didn't mean it like that. I don't know how mm. to respond. I mean, it was really, I thought it was quite significant. It really told you something about Britain's place in the world now. Yeah. But at the same time, I think it hurts them, mm. actually, because I think there is a big slice of voters in the States that don't think mm. that that should be the, you know, the people who think that should be their stance to the rest of the world already will vote Trump mm. come hell or high water, right? They're mm. not wavering voters. But I think there's a slice of wavering voters that would have been put off by that. Mm. Um Final question, has focus shifted to the Middle East at the expense of Ukraine or is the consensus holding up? I I vacillate on this. Mm. I, I think, yes, there have been obstacles to giving renewed funding, but at the same time, considering how many months into the conflict we are, it seems to be holding quite well. Like, there's no one going, fuck Ukraine. No. No one, yeah, definitely no one saying that in a sort of in a public forum. Yeah. You, you still hear a lot of support, you know, cross party consensus on on Ukraine. Um, I think there, you know, there is always the the fact that the voters have a sort of limited bandwidth for mm. these kind of things. So although they might be broadly supportive of Ukraine, if you know there's questions about the cost of living and our funding, you know, uh, you would you could imagine an argument being made of actually we should sort our problems out at home first. And that's the biggest obstacle, I think, to that kind of 3% commitment, which is that people say, well, what about the NHS and all these other things that we need to spend our money on? Um, and of course, Israel-Palestine has been a huge, um, not only international political issue, but a domestic political mm. issue as well. And that's taken up a lot of that particular bit of bandwidth we have for international conflict. But I think you're right. I think at the fundamental base level, with the important politicians, that support for Ukraine is still there. Um, and when people understand that actually Putin is at the heart of a lot of these issues across the globe, you understand how um, complicated and how it is all linked and how you can't just fight mm. one fire, you have to yeah, do yeah. them all. Now, we've reached the end of the show. So what are the stories that have gone under the radar this week? I'll start. Um, the National Audit Office has issued its report of the cost of alternative accommodation for asylum seekers compared to hotels. It carried out an audit of four planned sites, the Bibby Stockholm Barge in Dorset, former military sites at Scampton in Lincolnshire and Wethersfield in Essex, and uh, an ex-student accommodation in Huddersfield. And the analysis, you won't be surprised to find out, it found that even by 2034, at full occupancy, the projected overall co cost of the four sites will be higher than estimated hotel bill for the same people for the same period. So we are paying money we don't have to basically hide asylum seekers away from Tory marginals. And I just want people to think about that. The NAO did not assess, of course, the comparative cost of processing applications speedily and fairly, like a compassionate country rather than a Disney villain. But I'm pretty confident that that cost would be even cheaper. Seth, what's your end of the I've day? got a report as well. Um, kudos to The Guardian for flagging this up. This was Arts Council England that released the report into the world of opera, looking at mm. the sort of statistics. And um, a, a great deal of it is laudable. It sort of looks at diversity statistics and so forth. But there was an undercurrent that was less than welcome, and it was effectively assigning... Uh, shall we say, a weighing to the age of operas that was performed. And the sort of implicit subtext was that you're performing very poorly if you're doing lots of old stuff and there aren't enough new operas being performed. And it was sort of, well, mm. you know, if you speak to you know, a practitioner in the field, they'll tell you, um, how can you even begin to do new stuff well unless you sort of train yourself in that uh, whole sort of world and that metric and that discipline? Um, it's incredibly rigorous to do anything like, you know, Wagner opera is unbelievably hard. It's a ludicrous measure. It, it, it is ridiculous, sadly. Absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it means that... You could have basically a, a younger average if you just did Puccini all year long, yep. which is just over 100 years old, uh. than if you did 
six modern operas and no. two Handels. It's just, mm. That's ludicrous. Yeah. Ludicrous. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> Zoe. So uh, mine is unfortunately taking us back to the world of uh, the Tory right. But this was a particularly ridiculous intervention from Andrea Jenkins, who is a uh, Boris Johnson loving MP on the right of the party, um, who stood up in a uh, debate in Westminster Hall the other day and said she does not want primary age school children to learn about sex, full stop. Um, this was a debate on uh, teaching, I think, teaching um, children about LGBT issues, mm, mm. but she made it about sex education. Now, she said, um, as the mother of a primary age school child, I do not want him or other children, straight or gay, to learn about sex, full stop. Um, no problem doing it when they're older, but not in primary school. Now, I just think this is so ridiculous. Firstly, children need to be taught about sex, their bodies, puberty. I mean, whether you like it or not, there will be children in primary school who will go through puberty yeah, yeah. and they need to be taught that. But there's also a really serious point here, which is that if you don't teach children about sex, about boundaries, about consent, then that is how perpetrators of childhood sexual um, assault work. And it's really, really important. There are multiple studies showing that if you teach children what yes, what no means, what part of their body someone should see and what part of the body someone shouldn't see. It actually does prevent incident, um, yeah. incidents like that from taking place. So she talks about wanting to preserve children's innocence. She talks about it harming children. Actually, it harms children not to equip them with this knowledge. And of course, there's a way it can be done sensitively and appropriately. But I just think this culture war that the Tories are starting about children and LGBT issues and, and sex is actually far more damaging to children than it is helpful. And it's just really disappointing to see Tory MPs, you know, former ministers stand up in the House of Commons and just repeat myths, really, um, that are just based in more of that sort of right wing Tory nonsense. Here, here. And that's the show. Thanks to Seth Tebow. Thank you. And Zoe Grunewald. Thank you. And also a personal thank you from me to the incredible number of listeners who have reached out in the last few days with support after my beautiful mama's death. I could not reply to every message if I tried, but I have read all of them and every single word has been a balsam from my aching heart. So thank you for that. Stick around for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and a hearty salute to our generous supporters. You could join them and get the podcast early and without ads, plus lots more. Search Oh God What Now Patreon to find out how. We'll see you next time. Hello and many thanks from me to Will Moore King, Dino592 and Julie McCarran. A big hello and thank you for your generosity to Zach Evans, Nikki and Tim Butterworth. And hello from me to these returning backers who have re-upped the support, Peter Dawson, Tessa O'Neill and Meg Thomas. Thank you.